Hello, and welcome to Now Where Were We? A series of short videos about the history of Olympia, Lacey, and surrounding areas. Your host for this program is Deborah Ross. In this series, Deb takes us to locations that inform us about the history of our community. She also visits with local historians. We welcome your feedback and suggestions. And welcome to another edition of Now Where Were We? An ongoing series of short videos about the history of Olympia, Lacey, and surrounding areas. My name is Deborah Ross. And this is the next installation in the series of what I'm calling By the Decades. We are now up to the 1880s. And I'm very, very pleased to have with me today Shanna Stevenson, who is a local historian and a former coordinator of the Women's History Consortium. So she just knows everything about women's history, and I'm just thrilled to have her here with me today. Today we're going to be talking about a couple of events that happened in the early 1880s. And we're here in Sylvester Park because three women that we're going to be talking about lived or were active in this area. Shanna, tell me a little bit more about the three women that we're going to be talking about today. Right, we're going to talk about um, three really outstanding women, three of my favorites actually. Um, and uh, the first one is, is Mary Olney Brown. She was born in New York uh, and her family came over the Oregon Trail in the 1840s and they were first in uh, Portland. And uh, she had a very large family and she suffered a terrible loss. She lost two children coming over the Oregon Trail. They eventually settled on the west side of Olympia and uh, we don't know where she got her education, uh, but she turned out to be a really uh, vital voice for women's rights. Um, she was an eloquent speaker and writer, and um, she was part of many important events uh, in the suffrage movement. Um, she was part of the uh, first suffrage convention here in Olympia in 1871. She was uh, instrumental in what's called the New Departure Movement in 1869 in White River, where she just went to the polls and tried to vote. And also here in Thurston County in 1870 in Olympia, Grand Mound, and Little Rock. And she networked with her sister, her daughter, and a lot of other women who believed they should have the right to vote. She was a poet and a midwife. And unlike a lot of women, we have her firsthand accounts. So she was able to tell her own story and there's a wonderful account, wonderful accounts in what's called the history of women's suffrage. And I wanted to just quote from her obituary, which I think is outstanding. When she died in 1886, uh, they said, Mrs. Brown was a woman of more than ordinary intellectual endowments and a zealous advocate of many of the modern measures of reform. They said she wielded a trenchant pen, which I think is a great <laughs> way to say it, and many of her essays have aided materially in shaping popular sentiment towards women's enfranchisement. Uh, the second woman we're going to talk about is Clara Pottle Sylvester. She was from Maine. She married Edmund Sylvester, of course the namesake of Sylvester Park, uh, who's considered one of the town founders, and they came uh, to Olympia in 1854. He had gone back to Maine and, and married her. And of course, they built the handsome house that was across from Sylvester Park here. And she was uh, a hostess of many prominent suffragists, including Abigail Scott Dunaway. She attended the first uh, women's suffrage convention uh, in Olympia in 1871, and that was when Susan B. Anthony was visiting here. And she, according to Dunaway, accompanied Dunaway to lobby the legislature in the 1880s. And uh, the first meeting of the women's club that we're going to talk about was at her house. She was on the voter registration rolls in 1883, and she was recognized by Dunaway, the Oregon suffragist, as being very important in the victory in 1883. We don't know about her education. She characterized herself as liberal. Um, sometimes you kind of think she may have been in the background, but I think her status and her willingness to host suffragists uh, and, and to be supportive of them was very, very important. 
The third woman is Abby Howard Hunt Stewart. She was very well educated from Boston. She was a, definitely a leader with a strong will who found her stride in Olympia after she moved here. She was a founding member of the Women's Club in 1883 and was president of the local suffrage association in the 1880s. And she thought that suffrage, at once it was enacted in Washington Territory in the 1880s, was going to be quite tenuous. And she wanted to have uh, organizations like the Women's Club that would help women advance. And the club movement was really a training ground for women to achieve confidence, especially study clubs like the Women's Club of Olympia, where they explored topics and made presentations. And of course, uh, the Stewarts had the uh, block just across the street from us. I wanted to read a quote from people who knew uh, Mrs. Stewart. She said, they said she was forceful, intellectually ambitious, a woman of considerable reading and unusual business sense. She was especially anxious to see women's status bettered, and she wanted women to work toward their own betterment, both personally and before the law. Well, thanks for this introduction to the three women we're going to be talking about. Uh, Abby Stewart, who lived across the way at the corner of Legion and Capitol, the current site of Stewart Place, named after Abby and Robert Stewart. Clara Pottle Sylvester, who lived across the park in the Sylvester Mansion. And then Mary Olney Brown, who brought her ballots to the Thurston County Courthouse at the site of what's now Selden's Furniture Store. Shanna, one thing I find fascinating about these three women is that although each had the same goal of women's suffrage, they had different approaches to how they were going to accomplish that. Can you tell me a little bit more about the three women's approaches to achieving women's rights and women's suffrage? I think different styles and approaches were typical of the suffrage movement because it went on so long. Um, and I think... Um, uh, Mary Olney Brown's approaches to public advocacy were what we would now call community organizing and action were very important and in part because men were not sure that women wanted the vote and so she proved through her writing and actions that women did want the right to vote. I think that Stewart's ideas of creating clubs and educating women on issues and later centering on the vote as a part of municipal housekeeping were vital and it took a lot of courage for women to speak out for the right to vote and all you have to do is look at how Susan B. Anthony was treated when she was in the public eye to know that it was not easy for women to speak out. I think Clara Sylvester's role was like many other Olympia women, they lended their support and um, legitimacy um, of so socially and economically prominent women and uh, Many uh, suffragists, for example, wore white to show that they were pure because, again, it was very difficult for women to be in public life where people looked at them uh, very askance. And so uh, having the support of women like Clara Sylvester and, and other women here in Olympia, I think, was very, very important. So how did women finally get the right to vote in Washington Territory? Well, I, I guess we could call it a long and winding road. Uh, it was first proposed in the very first legislative session here in Olympia in 1854. And uh, over time, women gained some uh, rights to vote in school elections. And as I mentioned, some women uh, just decided they should be able to vote. And this was after the uh, constitutional, U.S. constitutional amendments after the Civil War uh, that said citizens have the right to vote. And these women said, well, we're citizens, so we should uh, just have the right to vote. Um, there were a series of bills introduced in the legislature um, in the 1870s, and they came very close in 1881. And it was in that uh, the next legislative session in 1883 when um, the territorial legislature did enact women's right to vote in Washington. And uh, Abigail Scott Dunaway, the Oregon suffragist, was pivotal in that. But there was a lot of support, both men and women, here in Olympia. Daniel Bigelow and Anne Elizabeth Bigelow, for example, were very supportive of women's right to vote. Women began voting in 1883, and State Archives has uh, recently uncovered the voter rolls from 1883. Oh, wow. And so you can see who the women were that registered to vote. And uh, then again in 1887, there was a territorial Supreme Court which, uh, a case, and uh, they, uh, the, the judges at that time invalidated women's right to vote. They said the enacting clause uh, was, uh, was not correct on the legislation. Uh, the territorial legislature reenacted it early in 1888. 
um, and right away again, uh, a woman by the name of Nevada Bloomer challenged the law. She was from Spokane, and the Territorial Supreme Court again invalidated it, stating this time that the um, the uh, law creating Washington Territory had meant to put that only male citizens had the right to vote. Um, so uh, women law kind of had it, lost it, had it, lost it again. And then uh, when we were poised to become a state in 1889, uh, meeting here in Olympia during the Constitutional Convention, women tried to get women's suffrage in the body of the Constitution and uh, failed. It was a separate ballot issue. So Washington came into the Union as a non-suffrage state. Um, there was an effort for a constitutional amendment, of course, after we were a state. It was a two-step process. The legislature had to authorize a constitutional amendment, and then it had to be a ratification vote of the all-male electorate at that time. So that failed in 1898. And then uh, around the turn of the century, there was a resurgence of the suffrage uh, movement here in Washington, and uh, the 1909 legislature uh, authorized a, uh, an amendment to the Washington Constitution that was ratified by the men of Washington in November of 1910. And so most Washington women gained the right to vote in 1910. And again, Sylvester Park is uh, really a um, uh, great location for us to be at for that because we have the old state capitol building on the eastern side of Sylvester Park. Right, and there's a very nice marker there commemorating uh, that that event okay. of uh, the enactment of the legislation that then became the constitutional amendment. Right. Well, Shanna, we've come a long way since a women's suffrage in 1909, but as you know, and as I think we both agree, we have a long way to go to fully achieve women's rights, even now in 2018. What can we learn from the activities of the women we've been talking about and their different approaches to achieving women's rights and women's suffrage? Well, I, I think uh, I often say that what the suffrage movement taught us was perseverance, uh, because it was in 1848 during the Seneca Falls Convention in New York when the idea of women voting really was uh, announced publicly for the first time. And uh, so, as we've seen, it took until 1910 in Washington and uh, 1920 nas nationally uh, for the federal amendment. So I, I think that uh, using different arguments for different constituencies, for example, here in Washington, of course, uh, we know men were going to be the ones who would vote on the amendment. So very cleverly in 1910, the suffragists published a cookbook. And uh, they said, you know, this was to assure men that things were not going to change. Women were still interested in domestic kinds of things. Uh, uh, May Arkwright Hutton famously said she was a taxpayer. So it was tax taxation without representation. So I think, uh, being very careful to use the, the best arguments for the people that are going to be influenced while staying true to what the movement represented is, is a lesson we can learn from them. Well, thank you so much, Shanna, for coming out here <laughs> on this rainy day to talk to us about the importance of uh, the women surrounding Sylvester Park and, um, and, and perhaps giving us some lessons on how we can persist in, <laughs> in furthering women's yeah, rights. They did in, persist, that's for <laughs> that's sure. That's right. Yeah. Uh, just one more thing, as long as we're near the uh, Emma Page Fountain here at the corner of, of the park, can you tell me just a little bit about Emma Page and, and why this fountain is here? Well, it's a remarkable tribute to a remarkable woman, I think. Emma Page was uh, born in the, in the Midwest, and she actually lost her sight as a young woman. And uh, she eventually graduated uh, from college in Illinois. And uh, she and members of her family came out here in the 1890s, and she was very interested in temperance. She's uh, very much a part of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And so that's why there's a water fountain here in the park. Um, and uh, she also was very interested in kindness to animals, and she actually helped get legislation passed that children would be taught that in schools. And uh, uh, a really interesting part of this fountain uh, is that there's a water trough here so that animals can get uh, a little bit to drink. The fountain was placed here in her honor in 1912, and her, uh, her legacy of kindness to animals is certainly one that resonates today as well. Right. Well, 
thanks again, Shanna, and uh, thanks for coming. And, and uh, for you viewers, next time you come to Sylvester Park, just think about the history around the park uh, of the women and the men who helped to make our territory and our state what it is today. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.